am excited to bring this message today, uh, in part because I just kind of always get this like nervous excitement when I am writing, preparing, thinking about a sermon all week, and then on the weekend before I go to preach that message, God says, I'm going to have you talk about something different. So, so that, that happened this weekend, and uh, some of you are like, okay, yeah, isn't that just Life Church? Uh, no, I'm better than I used to be. I, I used to just kind of every single week was like, I didn't know what I was going to preach until Saturday. Um, and sometimes on Sunday morning, like song three, it would happen. Like, oh, that's what I'm going to preach about today. But um, I, I feel like I've grown up in my ability to hear the Lord um, earlier in the week, which is good. But this week, uh, God strung me along for a little bit until he told me what, what he really wanted me to talk. Turned out the message I was trying to write was for me. So the one I'm going to share uh, with you today, I hope is for you. I think it's also been a blessing to me as well. But uh, really for the last month, we have been actually talking about what it looks like for Jesus to invite people into the life in his kingdom that we've been doing this series called The Invitation. And uh, my intention was to do kind of a, a final hurrah of that message today and then get, get us ready to move into Pentecost. And we're going to turn the corner a little bit and do something a little bit different today. Uh, but, but one of the things that I had really been inspired by as we were doing this series called The Invitation was I, I was struck by, and I have to confess to you, you can choose not to believe this if you think that I'm that smart. I, I, I didn't actually plan it this well. Um, but as I was writing each of the sermons in this series, I was just struck every single week, like, oh, there's another little piece of the thread. I, I just, by, by week three, I was like noticing, God, it seems like every Sunday you're trying to tell the church that we should go make disciples. And then God was like, duh. And then, uh, and then during week four, I started looking for it, and it just was so easy to find it. And uh, so we've been talking about this, this invitation into God's kingdom, and a big part of that invitation is, what are we going to do with what we have heard? This is, this is reminiscent of one of the final things that Jesus said to his disciples before he ascended up to the, the Father in heaven, where he now sits at the right hand of the Father, praying for you and I, the saints in the kingdom. Uh, he said, freely you have received, so freely give right? This is, a, if you're going to receive the kingdom, you're now responsible for the kingdom as well. Uh, and so there's just been this thread, and, and I was getting excited about all of the ways that we're building up to Pentecost, where we're given the power to go and give away the kingdom. And we're still going to talk about that next Sunday, which is Pentecost Sunday, the day that we celebrate the sending of the Holy Spirit so that we can actually fulfill Jesus's mission in and through the church. And just yesterday as I was praying about the sermon and sitting down to kind of put finishing touches on, the, on my notes and all of that, the Lord said, you know, it would be really good if you just make sure that it's really, really clear that if I'm going to empower the church to go and fulfill the mission, that it would be good if we all know what the mission is. So let's have a refresher on the mission. So you heard in our teaching text today, uh, that comes from... Uh, from a, a story that is really actually early on in Jesus' ministry. And we're going to dig into that, uh, that passage, that story today, to see what Jesus says his mission actually is. Because we want to be people who live, like Sharon said, on purpose. That's one of our core values here at Life Church. Uh, today, I will help us to, uh, hopefully help us to figure out a little bit more about that purpose, the, the mission. In fact, the title of my message today is just simply The Mission of God. So as we're getting ready for Pentecost next Sunday to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we want to make sure that we know why in the world do we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's a lot of benefits. We'll talk about some of those in the days ahead. Uh, but again, Jesus is early in his ministry in this story that we're going to dig into today. In fact, he goes out into the wilderness for 40 days and he fasts. And then when he's done fasting, the, the devil comes along and tempts him three different times. And Jesus wins that epic battle of spiritual proportions. And, and then he begins to actually do this itinerant traveling ministry. There's actually a verse right in before our teaching text today that just says Jesus traveled around town and around the different towns. And he was actually not in his hometown for a while. He was off doing ministry, kind of the beginning, the early season of his ministry. And then still relatively early on in his ministry, this is only in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 4 that we read this story today. Early on in his ministry, Jesus makes his way back into his hometown, 
and he has this opportunity to read from the scroll of Isaiah. Now, uh, you've already heard the teaching text. Sharon read that to you today uh, already. Uh, and and what, was, what was said um, after the reading is really interesting. What we want to get into is, is what, what happens right after Jesus does this scripture reading. That's going to be some of our some of our lesson today to kind of set the tone. Can, can we set the tone here for a second? Imagine that you went to church with Jesus. Okay, now let me just clarify. When I was a kid and I heard this story, I actually imagined that Jesus was the guest speaker being invited by, like his buddy was the senior pastor of the local church and you know, he heard that Jesus was gonna be back in town. Like, oh, I haven't been, we haven't hung out since the seminary days. Come speak at the church. They'd love to hear from you. Jesus uh, is back in town. And everybody shows up because Jesus is back in town. This is my kind of modern American Western New Testament church picture that I had of Jesus showing up to preach at his church. But all of this left me with some questions like, why was it that Jesus got to read? Was he really just the guest preacher? Why was Isaiah 61 chosen? Why did Jesus not read the entire prophecy of Isaiah 61? Uh, in, in fact, by the way, why, where Jesus stopped reading, interestingly enough, in the teaching text that you heard today, he actually stopped reading right in the middle of a sentence, which is very strange. Uh, and actually even more strange when you realize in its context what was actually happening. Uh, and then I, I always wondered, and, and I've actually preached before about why I thought people looked at Jesus and, and why everyone was just like staring at him. Why does he just sit down? Uh, and, and, and I had this kind of image in my mind of Jesus reads a, a verse and a half and then just drops the microphone and sits down and the image that I had painted for me, I don't know if someone told me this or if it was just I created a movie in my mind about what I thought this moment was like, that he just sits down, he just kind of casually sits facing the front, you know, and everybody in the whole church is waiting for point number two of his sermon. And then he kind of just like at some point he's just sitting there and he just kind of turns around and he's like, oh, today this is fulfilled. You're dismissed. That, that's how I, I had it play out in my mind. I... I assumed that Jesus, this, this guest preacher, comes in and just does this really weird half-point sermon and then drops the mic and just bounces. But in order to really understand this, we have to understand a little bit about Jewish culture. So Jesus was actually invited to this Shabbat or Sabbath gathering uh, of, the, of, of his friends in his hometown. And he was invited to play a specific role. The specific role in the Shabbat service or the Sabbath service that he was invited to play was called the, the Maftir. Uh, and he was invited as the, the person, the, the role he was playing. Kind of like how today I am the preacher. That's the role I'm playing right now. Jesus was invited to, be called, to, to play a role called the Maftir. And he was invited to do something called the reading of the Haftarah. Now the Haftarah is a Hebrew word which means conclusion. And so you can probably guess it doesn't come at the beginning of the service. It comes at the, at the conclusion of the service, right? You guys are so smart. Uh, so, so this would take place. There's like the there's the the reading of the Torah, and then the maftir would come up and read the haftarah, which would be the, there's the reading of the Torah, and then there's the haftarah, which was the reading of the prophets. And so there would be a selection of the prophetic writings from the Old Testament which is why now all of a sudden we get Isaiah was one of the chosen, because Isaiah is one of the prophetic books in the Old Testament. So he, he, the Maftir is handed the scroll that was designated to be read during that day. Now tradition says that the Maftir would come up, receive the scroll from the attendant, and then find the place where he was told to read. He, sorry ladies, back in that day it was always going to be a man who was going to read. Um, that's a different sermon. Um, and, and we land on the side of you totally can read the Bible and preach. If you've been in this room all day, you heard Sharon basically preaching at you. So uh, I think you know where we land on that. But anyway, so the man would be handed the, scripture, the scroll, open it up to the designated place, and tradition would say he would then declare a blessing 
uh, to open up the Haftarah reading. And the blessing would go like this. Praise to you. Uh, this is a translation of it into English, but they, they would recite this from memory in Hebrew. Praise to you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, who has chosen faithful prophets to speak words of truth. Praise to you, Adonai, for the revelation of Torah, for your servant Moses, for your people Israel, and for the prophets of truth and righteousness. And then they would read this designated passage. Now, the designated passage needed to be somewhere between 5 to 21 lines or verses of the prophetic writing. How many did Jesus read? One and a half. Okay. Then, after the maftir declares, uh, the, the, they do the reading, then they're supposed to do this closing blessing. And the closing blessing goes like this. Praise to you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe, rock of all creation, righteous one of all generations, the faithful God whose word is deed, whose every command is just and true. For the Torah, for the privilege of worship, for the prophets, for the Shabbat or Sabbath that you, Adonai, our God, have given us for holiness and rest, for honor and glory, we thank and bless you. May your name be blessed forever by every living being. Praise to you, Adonai, for the Sabbath and its holiness. That's it, by the way. That's all they were supposed to do. No teaching, no pontificating on the text, no changing the reading plan. Just blessing, reading, blessing, sit down and please be quiet. That was it, right? So Jesus gets up. He's invited at his home church. Hey, you're in town, Jesus. Come in. Would you come in? They would have just said, will you be the, the maftir today? And they would have known exactly what that would have meant, right? And Jesus would have, had, would have memorized the two blessings before and after the haftarah, when he was a kid, because he's a good Jewish kid growing up. And so he knows exactly how to play this role. But Jesus, the wonderful teacher, ev always looking for a way to subvert everyone's expectations, to point to the greater, bigger story of the kingdom of God that is actually going on, he comes in and he goes, I would love to be the muftir today. Oh, thank you so much for the honor. I, I'm deeply grateful for this. And so he, the, the Torah is read, and it's time for the muftir to come up. He's handed the scroll. I, there's no record whether or not he actually declares the opening blessing or the closing blessing. All we get from Luke is that he opens a passage that has about 11 verses in it, or about 11 or 12 sentences, depending on how you're looking at it. Uh, and, and then he reads one and a half sentences. He hands back the scroll to the attendant. In my personal opinion, I think he probably doesn't actually declare the closing blessing. He sits down, and now we can begin to understand why everyone in the room is looking at Jesus, the carpenter's son really breached protocol today. I wonder if they weren't even just looking at Jesus. They're looking at Mary, who's got to be like on the other side of the room. Men and women weren't sitting together at the time uh, in church services. Sorry, ladies, you were kind of... Praise God that we're... Yeah, anyway, different sermon. Okay. I think, they're, I think they're looking at Jesus. I think they're looking at Mary. Now, remember, Jesus was supposed to have said something. He was supposed to read this or declare this whole blessing, right? After he already read too short of a scripture reading, he just sits down. And they're going to be drilling holes into the back of his head and looking at his mom going, tell your son to finish the job. And so he does. He turns around and he says, what you just heard today has been fulfilled. Now, this matters because the rest of the passage is actually about God's wrath and about Israel becoming the ruling class of wealthy priests over the rest of the world. So it actually matters. It actually communicates something that Jesus didn't read the rest of Isaiah 61, or at least even the rest of that sentence that he only read the first part of, which would go like this, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of our God's vengeance, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, festive oil instead of mourning, and splendid clothes instead of despair. Now, just for the record, that's a great sentence. But it's a not yet sentence. You see, Jesus actually stopped at the moment where Isaiah's prophecy wasn't able to, where Jesus wasn't able to say this prophecy is being fulfilled today. 
See, in the middle of a sentence in Isaiah 61, it switches from the moment Jesus was in to a future not yet moment. It switches from the coming of the Messiah and the ministry of the Messiah to the fulfillment of all of it. That's like the, it goes from the Gospels to Revelation in the middle of a sentence, like on the turn of a comma. And Jesus knows that because he wrote the book. John chapter 1 tells us he actually is the living manifestation of the word of God. He, he, he said, okay, I'm just going to stop telling you the thing that I have to, I, I, do, I will finish that sentence, but not today. Just for context, for the record, so that we understand, everyone in the room would have thought massive breach of etiquette. And yet Jesus wasn't being rude, he was making a point. He was saying, what you just heard is happening now. What comes next, that's not happening yet. And and this is why, in my personal opinion, I just, I wasn't in the room, I'm not that old, I, I didn't hear whether or not he did or not, or didn't, but in my personal opinion, I think Jesus most likely did not recite the closing blessing. Because if he isn't going to finish the reading about the finish of finishing of the work, it would make sense that he would also not re- recite the closing blessing to bless the finishing of the work. It, it would just make sense. Now, if he did or didn't, it doesn't take away or add anything to the story, except I'm just trying to give you an image of why these people might have been so stunned that Jesus didn't finish Isaiah 61, that he just sat down and that what he said suddenly turned a crowd who had been celebrating his return, inviting him to take part in the service, and being really excited about the ministry that God was doing through his life. And then all of a sudden, this is where you see a turn. I'm not so sure about this Jesus guy. Who does he think that he is? And a lot of it has to do with he just loves to breach protocol so that he can teach us a lesson. So Jesus was saying, something has started today. Just because I am here, something is different. And I can't bless the end of it because it's an ongoing work. Again, that part is a little bit of conjecture. That's my own personal opinion. But, but I believe that Jesus is saying that, that something is beginning that was prophesied in Isaiah 61. And today is the beginning of the mission of God that was prophesied in Isaiah 61, that you heard. And so Jesus recites or reads these six statements about the mission of God. And he says, today, the mission is here. Or the great missionary is here. Today, you get to see it. And so because we have been invited into the kingdom, and in the middle of that invitation, we've been reminded repeatedly that there is a mission that we're supposed to be on. And because next week, we're going to re- celebrate the sending of the Holy Spirit, which, by the way, you don't have to wait until next week to receive the Holy Spirit. You can do that literally at any time. Uh, all you have to do is ask. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But to- next Sunday, we're going to celebrate that. And right in the middle of that, let's just take a look We'll run through it. Let's take a look at what these six statements that Jesus makes about his mission actually are. Now, the place that we'll begin is to just start with the same uh, preamble or preface that Jesus makes about his mission. The very first thing that Jesus says is what Isaiah prophesied was, it begins with this declaration, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is a great Pentecost statement to make, by the way. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, I want you to understand that this was a prophecy hundreds of years before the Messiah came, saying that even the Messiah, the Savior of the world, would declare that his mission is dependent on partnership with the Spirit of God. And I would just propose to you, if Jesus was only able to fulfill his mission because of a partnership with the Spirit of God. How much more so are we also dependent on the Spirit of the living God? 
And by the way, this is why Jesus, before he ascended, we touched on this a little bit last week, but this is why in Acts chapter 1, verse starting in verse 4, before Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, it says uh, he commanded his disciples not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. The Father's promise is the sending of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus said, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. For the record, it was 10 days later that the Holy Spirit was sent onto the disciples. So the mission of God is so massively important that Jesus spent three years showing his disciples what it looked like, and then he still, after a three-year training course, 24-7, with the Son of God himself, hands-on, eyes-on Jesus. You've watched everything. You should know how to do this mission. After all of that, he still said, don't you dare do it without the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is the initiator of, uh, of our ability to receive salvation in the first place and certainly our ability to be empowered to do the mission of God. But make no mistake, there isn't a single one of us who isn't uh, declared to or commanded to fulfill the mission. So therefore, it follows that there isn't a single person who has ever been created for whom God said, oh, that person or that group or that denomination or that gender or that race or that class, that socioeconomic group, those people don't really need the Holy Spirit. Or, or that he would say, oh, those people really need the Holy Spirit. I guess those guys are smart enough to figure it out on themselves. Never once. And Jesus models that by saying, me, the very Messiah, the Savior of the world, I need the Spirit too. So then Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. First thing he says, number one, is to preach the gospel to the poor. We've talked about this for several weeks now. Uh, but step one of Jesus' mission is to preach the gospel. Gospel is a phrase which means good news. Have you heard the good news? Have you ever shared it with somebody? The good news is that Jesus, who's the very Son of God, paid the debt for our sin that we could not pay. Because of his perfect love and his perfect sin-free life, he was eligible to become the sacrifice, to have his blood shed and sacrifice himself as a spotless lamb so that the debt for our sin could be paid. You now no longer owe any debt to God because of all of the sins that you have paid because of the blood of Jesus that would wash over you, cover you, remove your sin as far as the east is from the west. On the third day after Jesus was, uh, after he willingly gave up his life for you, he rose from the dead and he is alive today, offering to wipe away the sin debt from anyone who believes in him. This is the gospel. This is the good news. So that debt is why Jesus says he was sent to preach the poor. The gospel to the poor. Who are the poor? Everyone who owes the debt. So if you've been like blood bought, if you've been, you know, like a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus, if, if you are saved, whatever you want to call it, if you are a disciple, you're rich. Oh, is he a prosperity teacher? I don't know if I can go to this church. Yes, prosperity every single day of the week. I've been given the greatest inheritance I could possibly ever get. I couldn't have earned it. It was given to me for free. I am now the son of a king. In fact, that prosperity is so good, I don't even have to worry about, like, dollar bills. I, I mean, I just, I'm playing with a different economy. The debt that I had that was sending me to hell has been paid. This is the good news. I'm just asking you on a Sunday morning, do you know the good news? And then Jesus would follow it up and say, I'm glad you know the good news. Do you tell the good news? Because Jesus said, step one of my mission that I sent you on is proclaim or preach, share, tell the good news. Preach is a declarative term, which means that even though it's great that St. Francis of Assisi is credited as being the guy who said, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use your words. He's telling us your life should look like you're a Christian. Yes, that is great teaching. But 
If you never tell the good news out of your mouth, you're not preaching the gospel. And now that you know that, you're responsible to do it. Got him. You, you have to tell the gospel, preach the gospel. You have to make sure that people understand what the gospel actually is. Do you know why? Because there are so many almost gospels out there. There are so many versions of not quite true that people are like, you know what? Jesus was a nice guy, and if I'm also a nice person, then me and Jesus are great. No, that's a lie. You're terrible. You have a debt that you cannot pay, but Jesus paid it. He is the only way to the Father. Do you preach the gospel? Talked more about that last week. Go listen to that on the podcast. Let's move forward. Okay, let's just say very practically speaking, uh, Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, do the work of an evangelist, and so in so doing, fulfill your ministry. That's another way of saying you fulfill the mission of God by preaching the gospel. And just to make this super practical for everyone who just disqualified yourself because you don't have a microphone in your hand or a church that you lead or whatever, uh, this actually, I'm not even sure, is always preaching the gospel. I think this is like teaching the preachers. Right? The best preaching you'll, that it will ever be done is probably actually not out inside a, a church building. The reality is these days, most people that come inside a church building already know the gospel. You come in here so that you can know how to share the gospel out there. Sorry for the days that we've done a really bad job at that, and we made you think that this was actually preaching the gospel. And, and I'm so glad that in the moments that this is preaching the gospel, that maybe you had a sermon inside a building and it did change your life, and it was the moment that you gave your life to Jesus. But can I just tell you that most people don't actually meet Jesus because they heard a TED Talk. Most people meet Jesus because they met a person who told them the gospel. And there's a baby in this room who's more excited about this than most of you are. So just go tell someone the good news about how Jesus brought you to life. So the mission of God is, number one, fulfilled when we preach the gospel to the poor. Number two, when we heal the brokenhearted. The language here for brokenhearted paints a picture of someone who's experiencing crushing, shattering, or breaking in their heart, in their mind, or even in their character, or in their inner life. In other words, a person who is just in pain. So this can cover people who are experiencing grief or depression, who've experienced trauma or abuse and are survivors of such things, people who are demonized or demon-possessed, which are two different things. Ask me about that later. Uh, This covers people who are suffering from chemical imbalances that result in mental health issues, uh, which is also different than being demonized. Those are two different things, and God heals them both. Amen. Uh, And then it also covers people who have anything else in their life that just causes you pain. Now, there's an important distinction here that Jesus is the Savior, and uh, we are the ones who are sent to tell his story. So Jesus is the healer. Our job is to point the brokenhearted to the healer. Like it says in Matthew 28, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened or carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Our job is just to tell them where to go. And if they don't know how to get there themselves, we will walk with you until you meet him. So the original prophecy in Isaiah 61 actually says something really helpful that clarifies whose job is whose, because we're not the healers, we're just the ones who send people to the healer. Uh, Isaiah 61 uses the term, bind up the brokenhearted, and I love that, because it just gives me the image of, I'm going to take the idea of healing, or the name of Jesus, the healer, I'm just going to wrap you in the presence of Jesus. I'm going to love you with the presence of Jesus. Sometimes this looks like laying hands on the sick and saying, be healed in the name of Jesus. Maybe it looks like holding space for a person. Maybe it just looks like holding a person together when their life feels like they're falling apart. I, I, I find the imagery uh, to, to bind up the brokenhearted to be really, really helpful. It reminded me uh, just yesterday of all of the times when my mom, who is a retired nurse, would uh, she was the most skilled at this when I would roll my ankles a lot when I'd play soccer as a kid. Uh, my mom would be the person who would wrap my ankle in an ace bandage. 
And she did it so good that eventually I knew how to wrap my own ankle. And then I became a person who wrapped somebody else's ankle when they had a busted ankle. By the way, that's just a side note on how discipleship works. Um, but, but you see how my mom didn't heal my ankle. She bound it up so that it could be healed. And this is how we fulfill the ministry of Jesus. We bring people to God who is, uh, we refer to him as the great physician. Uh, We're merely the physician's assistant, wrapping people like somebody who is expert at ace bandaging a broken heart with the love or the word or the presence of Jesus. Jesus has the power to heal. Can I just say that one more time? In a world where we have heard about sickness and death for two straight years and just for too long, Jesus has the power to heal. I think it's, it's high time that in the church we start talking like this again. Jesus has the power to heal, right? Jesus has the power to heal, and he'll do healing in all kinds of different ways, and I'm all about go to the doctor. If I wasn't, then I would have had to rebuke my mom for being a nurse all of these years. I'm not about to rebuke my mom. You try that. (laughs) I'm thankful for medicine. I'm thankful for the God who created science. We believe that those things can dance together. But I also believe that there are moments when Jesus says, enough, be healed. Amen? Right. So I can offer, practically speaking, to, offer, to, to bind up a person who is broken by offering them love, community, honesty, safety, praying for them for miracles, signs and wonders to happen. And, I, and the reality is I cannot do that unless I'm willing to get close into relationship with a person. So fulfilling the mission of God looks like being in relationship with a person in such a safe way that they reveal where they are brokenhearted so that you can be the blanket of the love that represents the healing power of Christ for them. And then you let Jesus do his work through relationship. For the record, that actually could look like a hug. And just because I I know that there are some people in our church who want me to say this, I want to honor them. If you're going to hug someone, ask first. Right? And, And can I just say, that has just as much to do with COVID as it does have to do with the awareness that we should have in the church that there are just some people who were hurt by somebody when they were before they met you and that that if you're not careful your hug can actually trigger a reminder of abuse rather than be a warm blanket of love so we always say can i give you a hug right we all and if they say no please don't make me have to finish that sentence <laughs> And then, okay, that's, I, I don't have time to get into the rest of how that could turn into a good sermon. Just love your neighbor well. Um, so the mission of God is fulfilled when we preach the gospel to the poor, when we bring healing to the brokenhearted, and number three, when we proclaim liberty to the captives. So, th- th- by the way, that just sounds like exactly what it is. Proclaiming liberty to the captives. We find people who are in bondage, and Jesus came to set them free. You were in bondage. You had a massive debt that you could not pay. You were bound up, and Jesus came to declare liberty to us. So the question is, who are the captives? All of them. Everybody. The people who are captive to sin, to demons, to addiction, to physical captivities, to social captivities. The church should have her eyes wide open to be able to see captivity wherever it is in the world. I think a lot of times recently we're actually missing the big, big captivities because we can't even see that we are captive to entertainment or to comfort. It would be good if the church would get free, be at liberty from the captivity that we're in to feeling like somebody owes us something all the time. And if we're not comfortable, something's definitely wrong. Be free. We set, we we declare, we preach, we proclaim liberty to captives. And, And again, this can be physical or spiritual bondage. Jesus, though, is the key to open every kind of cage that a person is in. Jesus is the key to set people free from demonic bondage. We see Jesus fulfill his mission. At least 12 separate times in the Gospels, we see Jesus casting demons out of people. 
none of them seemed to be any kind of struggle for Jesus, just for the record. There was never a moment where he was like, get out of here, demon. And, and then the demon was like, no. <laughs> never. Why? Because Jesus is the ultimate authority. It would be good if we could walk in the same authority that he gives us. When Jesus proclaims liberty from demonic forces, there was liberty, and he has given us the same authority. Why? Because he gave us his name. Jesus is also the key to set people free from social bondage. When we see Jesus fulfilling this mission, it's when he points to a higher kingdom than the world systems and says, this is messed up. This is how you should live. Right? Right? We proclaim liberty to the captives when we speak of the freedom possible in God's kingdom. God is not simply interested in justice. He is the God of justice. I'm just weary of people saying that the church needs to stop talking about social justice. But the world shouldn't have had to come up with a term for that. You know why they did? Because we got quiet. We insulated. We want justice in the room. And God is calling us back out into injustice to be people who would proclaim liberty to the captives. Amen? This is the work of, of speaking out against all kinds, of bond, all kinds of bondage, abuse, systems and structures and demonic forces alike. Wherever we see it, God's people should be the first to say it does not have to be this way. That's what it sounds like to declare or proclaim liberty to the captives. So the mission of God is fulfilled when we preach the gospel to the poor, bring healing to the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, and fourth, proclaim sight to the blind. Jesus is the healer for the brokenhearted and for the blind. And this blindness is about physical blindness, but also your inability to see what's actually going on in the world. And, and I don't mean that in some conspiracy nut way. 90% of the times that I've had someone tell me, can you see what's actually going on in the world? Then they tell me about something just nutty. <laughs> just wild, right? And they, and you know, I mean, whatever. Google and Facebook and Reddit and all these places. I'm personally going to try to help people have the, the blindness be healed so that they can see what's actually going on based on Scripture. Amen, Pastor Tim. Yes, the word of God is the high standard. We fully agree with that. Okay, just calm down. <laughs> All right, let me just say it to you this way. God is in the miracle business, and he's also in the teaching business. When you see a person with physical blindness, I don't know why we have any kind of a problem just saying, hey, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. But it would also be really, really good. And, and, and not in any way trying to minimize the laying on of hands. I just don't know that, that, act, that this actually is that point. There's other places where we see lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. I think what Jesus is actually saying is I'm in the teaching business. It would be really, really great if the church knew the truth so well that when they saw the truth, they saw the lie and knew the truth, and were able to, what, have an answer in season and out of season for the hope that is within you, that we, were, that we would actually read what Paul said to Timothy, that in the last days there's going to be some craziness, and that you should be able to defend the truth. This is, this is a lot of the, the counsel that Paul is giving to Timothy. Know the truth, and when you see craziness, preach the truth. But you can't do any of that if you're blind, you can't see it if you're blind. How do we get blind? We spend so much time staring at the TV or at the news or at the things of the world. It's just wild how much we think that we can see what's really going on and we're staring at the wrong thing. God, give us eyes to see. So very simply, we partner with the mission of God when we help people see. Certainly this can have physical results, but it is primarily in this context, in this moment, the work of pointing to the light of biblical truth in a dark world. So the mission of God is fulfilled when we preach the gospel to the poor, bring healing to the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, and proclaim sight to the blind. And fifth, when we set at liberty those who are oppressed. 
I love this because this is the moment when the world says, we're so tired of your thoughts and prayers that the church gets to go, look, we totally agree that it shouldn't just end at just thoughts and prayers, which is why we're not just proclaiming liberty for the captives, we're setting at liberty those who are oppressed, those who are in captivity. Jesus didn't just say that his mission was to talk about freedom, it was to give freedom, right? So every single time that we're criticized for not doing enough, you know what, they might be right, we should be doing at least enough. I don't know whose measurement of enough is, but I feel like sometimes, most of the time, we get stuck in really needing to hear James remind us what he wrote when he said, be doers of the word and not hearers only. And he goes on in chapter 2, if a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, stay warm and be well fed, I can proclaim liberty to you. But if you don't give them what the body needs, what good is that? In the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. Two quick points of clarity here. Number one, you do not have to be involved in every single issue that you see. It would be good for you, for your spouse, for your kids, for your mama, for all your Facebook friends, if you just would not be involved in every single issue that you can. And can I just tell you, you'll live longer. One, because no one will want to murder you. And two, because you'll stop having so much anxiety piling everybody else's issues on top of you. Maybe it would be good if you ask God what issues you should be partnering with or passionate about or speaking life to. So you do not have to, because look, our job is to fulfill the mission of God. But you're not God. So do the thing that he sent you to do. Could you imagine if a missionary was sent from our church to Haiti and then they spent all of their time talking to the people in Haiti about how there's great needs in Ghana? Everyone in Haiti would be like, what'd you come here for? (laughs) Go where you're sent. You don't have to be engaged in everything. You probably have more friends and you'll live longer. And your ministry will be more effective. Second point of clarity is that every single form of oppression in the world is rooted in bondage. Spiritual bondage. And all of that is made possible because of sin. I I, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but there is just a, a work that is subversively working in the church to try to get us to stop talking about how sin is actually our root problem. Stop talking about sin. People don't like that. I know, it's fun. You, I know why you do it. I know why I do it. I know why we fail to be perfect. It's hard to be perfect. It's more fun to be... Do you see how easy that was to justify just to get tired doing the good work? Peter, Peter says something. He says... Um, Let me find it for you. This isn't in my notes, but I just need to read the Bible to you today. Is that all right? Peter, Peter, Peter. Is it second Peter? Nope, it's first Peter. First Peter, chapter two. Ah, here we go. (laughs) Ha, ha. Uh, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. I mean, that's solid advice. And then in verse 2, this is is 1 Peter 2, verse 2. Like newborn infants, desire the pure milk of the word so that you may grow up into your salvation. If, if, say if, if you have tasted that the Lord is good. Okay, look. Every form of oppression is rooted in spiritual bondage. Do you know how we get free from the spiritual bondage? We don't just try hard. We fall in love with righteousness. You fall in love with the word. God is not saying, yeah, look, I I know sin is is rough and and you're just going to kind of have to deal with it. God is saying, no, love my word. 
Love the word. Do you want to be a person who is actually able to set at liberty those who are oppressed? Be set at liberty. How do you do that? Give your life to Jesus and fall in love with the word if you have indeed seen that the Lord is good. And I would just propose to you that if you are constantly struggling to fight against the sin in your life, maybe there's a place where you've not yet seen that the Lord is good. Because sin has a way of falling off of people who are madly in love with Jesus. And so then we get to be people who are madly in love with Jesus and go out into the world and just share that the Lord is good. Which is actually where we begin to come full circle. Because the last thing that Jesus says here in this in this point and a half of a sermon that he made that's taken me six points to preach. As he says, preach the gospel to the poor, bring healing to the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, proclaim sight to the blind, set at liberty the captives, and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The mission of God begins with preaching the gospel, and it ends with proclaiming even more good news. It's the acceptable year of the Lord. If you are so in love with God, so full of his word, you eagerly crave the word of God because you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. What do you think is naturally going to come out of your mouth? You're going to preach and proclaim and declare the year of the Lord's favor. Now, in the Old Testament context, for the, for the people of Israel, the acceptable year of the Lord or the year of the Lord's favor would have also been referred to as the year of Jubilee. God's intention during Jubilee is that it was honored every 50 years, and among other things, Jubilee meant that all debts would be forgiven, that sounds familiar, and that every slave would be set free. We've talked about this. It turns out that Jesus was the fulfillment of God's intention in Jubilee. The people of Israel were really bad at honoring that themselves, and they kept falling into holding slaves and holding debts. And so Jesus said, hold on, guys, I got this. Let me come and set up a system where I will actually be Jubilee for you. And it'll be every day for the rest of your life where you don't have debts. Now, there's a standard to that. You have to also make sure that you, as you accept the year of the Lord's favor, that you also give away the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus' ministry was to usher in eternal jubilee, and our ministry should look like spreading jubilee wherever we go. Where the church has a reputation for legalism and putting heavy burdens on people, we should actually proclaim the joy-filled freedom that Jesus offers. Jubilee is the restoration of possession and property. It's the restoration of relationships. It's the restoration of freedom. Jubilee means that as God's children, we are freely given the inheritance that sin robbed from us. Freedom and favor with God, eternal life, and an identity as royal children and royal priests in the kingdom of God. So we proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord when we do the work of making disciples, when we forgive sins as our sins have been forgiven, and as we extend the blessings of God to others in our words, but also in our actions, right? We do the work of justice. We declare freedom and liberty. We declare sight for the blind. Jesus' mission had these six directives, preach the gospel to the poor. Anyone who is indebted to God, preach the gospel. Heal the brokenhearted. Wrap people in the love of God and let him do the work of healing. We proclaim liberty to the captives. We proclaim recovery of sight to the blind, teaching them what the word actually says. Then we set at liberty those who are oppressed, not just telling them you get to be free, but helping them walk out of the set, the cell. And then we proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the unending jubilee of life in the kingdom of heaven. This was God's mission, and it's our mission. We see it very clearly in John 20, verse 21. He says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. So then we would just say that to live on the mission of God or to fulfill God's mission in the world is to minister the same way Jesus did. 
there's, there's no denying it. There's no hiding it. We live in a dark, pain-filled, broken world. But Jesus did not come to debate the answers. He came to be the answer. We minister Jesus when we give the answer to people. Just point people to Jesus. Amen? So let me ask you two really vital questions. The first question is a question that you can only answer for yourself, but it's also a question that can become a tool for you to ask other people. Have you received the good news that ushers you into the jubilee of the kingdom of heaven? It's a long-winded way to say, are you a follower of Jesus? Has, has the gospel become a gift for you? We might say, are you saved? Are you a Christian? Not socially, not not, not on, online. Not in the ways that some people call themselves a Christian, but don't behave like it. I mean, are you sold out, surrendered, committed, captivated by and captive to the King of Kings? Has the gospel given you a personal good news story? You know the answer to that. The second question that I would ask you is, who do you know to whom Jesus would send you on mission? Well, just think about that, that for a second. If I were to ask you, in what places in your life do you see bondage and blindness? Who comes to mind? That's probably your missions field. What, what people do you feel drawn to love? until you see them become free in Jesus. Remember, you don't have to be drawn to love everybody. Not every single person is your missions field. For some of us, it might not even be safe to go and minister to some of the people that would come to mind. And so what we do for them is we pray, God, send workers to that harvest. Please, God. We genuinely pray. But then where are the people that we feel drawn to go and be the love of Jesus? What spiritual or social systems of oppression and bondage do you feel drawn to proclaim liberty over the people trapped within them? Like which, which of these massive social movements, when you hear it, you can't unhear it? When you see it, you can't unsee it? And maybe a bonus question is, what are you going to do about that? You have to do something. Whatever you do in response is your answer. Will you go? We sing, Lord, send revival, start with me. That song is written in the context of Isaiah being in the throne room of God, saying, I'm a man of unclean lips. It's a response to God asking a question, who should I send? Who will go for us? God, would we be people who would sing this song, send revival, start with me, send me. Send me to the places where I see brokenness. Send me to the people who I see are blind and in bondage, the captives. Send me, God, to the brokenhearted. Could you just take a moment and just right where you're sitting, could you, before we do anything else, could you just name, you don't have to do it out loud, you don't have to, you could whisper it, but would you just name before God, almost as if you were placing them at the feet of Jesus, name those people that you thought of in this moment, God, I, I would pray for, they're in bondage, they're bound. God, as we present these names to you, Help us to keep our hearts free from judgment. We do not present these names to you in a heart of judgment today. But because we love them, and because more than us, you love them. We name these people that we care about today in bondage. Would you also name those areas in the world that you thought of? Where do you see injustice and brokenness and you feel a sense of compassion to do something? God, we name the homeless in the Antelope Valley. We name 
single mothers struggling to get by. We name the addicted. God, would you send your people to the broken, to those who are depressed, traumatized, abused, the lonely, the isolated, the wounded, and the hurting, the afraid, the broken, the blind, the overly political, the other party, the white, the black, the Hispanic, the Asian, the other. God, where there is injustice, help us to see it, and would you send us? Would you just take one more moment before we do anything else? And would you have a conversation with God? Uh, My original intention was to have you turn to a neighbor and have this conversation with each other and then pray for one another, but it feels so much that this is a deep work today that I want to invite you just to have a conversation with Jesus. Now, it's up to you if you do anything in this moment, but can you have a conversation with God? Where do you experience bondage and brokenness and injustice and blindness? And would you ask God, God, would you do a work in my life? God, where I am blind, would you point me to your word so that I can see truth? Where I'm broken, would you send people to be the blanket of your love for me? Ask God for what you need from him today. It's possible that you could be sitting in this room and what you're realizing that you need from him, or maybe you're watching this online, maybe not even live, maybe you're watching this later and you would say, I am not a follower of Jesus. This would be your moment to simply say, Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I put my faith in you and I choose to follow you today. Help me to live with you and for you, free in your name. Finally, I want to pray two blessings today. Number one, I want to pray a blessing over you. And then before we move on from this moment, I I think I'd like to pray a blessing to the Lord together today. And so let me pray this blessing over you in the name of Jesus. May you be free, healed, and able to see the favor of the Lord in your life. May your cup overflow from the goodness of God in your life. And may you pour God's goodness from your cup into others as a blessing. Amen. Amen. Now, I I would like it if we could just close this moment by honoring the Lord. There's this old tradition that I shared with you earlier uh, today where the reader of scripture would close the moment with a prayer of blessing. Uh, I'm going to pray this blessing as as an honor to the Lord. As I pray this prayer of blessing, if you're able to and you'd like to join me in a moment of honoring God as the king of kings and uh, the real leader of this church, would you, if you're physically able to and you would like to honor God with me, simply stand to your feet today? And we'll close with this moment. Uh, We've put a lot of attention on what God can do for us Let's have the last thing we say as a church today uh, before we leave this place be a blessing back to God. So this is the closing of the Haftarah reading, this blessing. Praise to you, Adonai our God, sovereign of the universe, rock of all creation, righteous one of all generations, the faithful God whose word is deed, whose every command is just and true. For the word, for the privilege of worship, for the prophets, and for this Sabbath that you, Adonai, our God, have given us for holiness and rest, for honor and glory, we thank and bless you. May your name be blessed forever by every living being. Praise to you, Father, for the Sabbath and its holiness. 
God, we bless you. Amen. Amen.